I grew up on this farm where we are right now. Uh, my parents never had very many acres or very much money and uh, graduated from KU in 1973 and with a degree in economics came back here and started a dairy with my brother and brother-in-law and we did that for about 15 years and then went to cow-calf business and cattle feeding. Went back to school to get my PhD in 91. Was a professor at K-State for about five years and then moved back to the farm again in 2007. So currently here uh, farming again with my twin brother, uh, my son and a number of employees and we're 100% grain farming now, no longer any cattle in our operation. Here in this area we're ex extremely uh, semi-arid, normally about 20 and a half inches of rain the last couple years, more like 10. We raise typically corn followed by grain sorghum or milo, followed by yellow peas, and then followed by wheat. Basically we're, we're trying to eliminate some, what's called summer fallow where you let the ground idle for a year. Uh, it's all about saving water and, and trying to get more cropping intensity despite not having very much rain. Uh, when I grew up, everything in this area, the cropping side was all wheat, fallow wheat. And a wheat rotation worked out very well with a cow-calf operation because you had time to calve the cows in the spring before you had to do any tillage work on the wheat, fallow ground. And likewise in the fall, you had your wheat planted before it was time to wean calves. It worked out beautifully. Once we start moving to more no-till, more row crops, it turns out that cattle interfered with cropping on the labor side of things, but even more importantly than that, on the soil moisture perspective. You could not graze any crop residue anymore because the cattle removed too much residue, which, pre which reduced the yields on following crops based on not, not capturing as much water in the soil. And so those were the reasons that we changed back to a, a grain operation only instead of livestock. Well, we're kind of fanatics on research, and so we had done the research before we got out of the cows and could measure the differences in yields associated with cattle. So we actually did some homework ahead of time. Still, it was we were afraid because uh, cattle tend to soak up labor in the winter time, and we were a little afraid that you know we might have some excess labor at first. So you have a little fear as any time you make a change, but basically that fear went away after the first year, and that was in 2003. Uh, was the first year that we got rid of the cattle. And so after that, no, it's been very obvious. We're, we feel very firm that it was the correct thing to do. And what we're seeing in the whole area, which is mixture of cropland and pasture, what we're seeing is that folks are specializing more. People tend to be cattlemen or they tend to be crop farmers, but not so much a mixture of the two like they all were when I grew up. Ag economics, but principally I was a commodity futures broker on the side throughout the 80s and one of the reasons I wanted to get a PhD in ag economics so I could give better advice on commodity futures trading, uh, not to be of course, the, the more I learned, the more I learned I didn't know anything and nor did anyone else when it came to trading commodity futures. Basically is what the end result. The market's very efficient, very hard one to deal with. So I did learn that. After writing a dissertation on Kansas City wheat futures trading, I did learn that. Farming has been subject to rather large economies of size, in my opinion. And so we've been heavily focused on growth, especially since I moved back in 07. Uh, we focus a lot on research. Our whole farming is basically a research operation. Every acre of our farm is, is fertilized differently than every other acre. Uh, based on precision agriculture techniques. Uh, we're very, what I would say, fairly early adopters of technology. So uh, technology adoption and growth would be the two biggest things, but by far the most important thing, and, and we always underestimate its impact, is people stuff. I mean, it's really all about people in the end. You can talk economics, you can talk numbers and figures, but it's all about people, having the right people in place, motivating them properly, and having everybody have a good time. The number one thing that I would say is financial planning and especially accrual accounting on a regular basis more frequent than once a year. We do it here every month. We know exactly where we stand, balance sheet accounting, every single month. 
And that's the single most important thing. It sounds very mundane, but it's the single most important thing to ensure that you make proper decisions. Actually, technology adoption is something I've spoken on many times while on my job at K-State and also since I left the job at K-State. It's one of the most difficult things is deciding when you should adopt a technology. Uh, there are some that we call belly button technologies that have become very obvious uh, very quickly. They make money. Some of the things like auto steer on tractors, the guidance systems on tractors, uh, Roundup Ready soybeans, Roundup Ready corn, those were all belly button technologies. Those are the ones you have to do, otherwise you're going to find yourself doing them late and you're going to find yourself always losing money because you're not keeping up. The ones that are harder are the ones that are, take a longer term investment, either education or experience, and that might be some of the soil fertility management, some of the precision ag connected with that. No-till farming is a classic example which people don't necessarily observe the profits associated with it immediately. And so we always recommend take some technologies that you think might go down the road and start working on them. Start doing research on them, even if it's just on a portion of your farm. Start building experience, and then as soon as it looks like they might be successful, charge ahead and do the rest of the farm and make it happen. It's not easy. I, I don't want to say it's easy at all, trying to figure out what technologies to adopt. We make a, countless little mistakes. We try not to make the big mistakes. As we, as we grew in crop farming and focused on the crops and opposed to the cattle, uh, grain production was the driving factor. Uh, grain elevators in town, your commercial elevators, tend to be outdated for the most part because they've evolved over many years for smaller trucks in different situations. And so we, had, we decided just to go ahead and build a new grain facility out in the open where you could expand easily. It's a very common thing for some of the larger farmers to do to focus on grain production. You have a little bit better control. It's not like you can pick prices any better, but there tends to be a, about a 30 cents a bushel premium on corn to 40%, 40 cent premium on some other crops just to have in the grain in your control which is just by selling it off the farm as opposed to selling it from a commercial elevator. So that's a heavy component. And then you can throw in the convenience of harvest, the speed of harvest, and, and keeping everything moving quickly during harvest. Those are other reasons for having on-farm storage, and those were the, the motivating factors in our case. <music>